happy that you join with us this morning. If you're not already standing, will you please stand and let's sing and worship our
so happy, so glad that you are here this morning and you join us in worship. And during this next song, there will be communion available throughout the auditorium, so at any time through this song, you can feel welcome to take that if you feel led to. Now let's sing about the goodness of our God. Of the goodness of God. 
us, God, every morning, every day, every night, because you are faithful and you are such a loving, kind, good, good God. And Father, even if some of us are struggling to believe that this morning, if some of the things that we're going through, things that are on our heart that we're struggling with, and it can be hard sometimes to believe fully that you are good, but Lord, this morning we declare in your goodness that you are good, that you are loving, that even in those things that we are struggling with, Lord, you want to help us with those. So we surrender those to you. We surrender to you. You are good. You care for us. You care for our heart. And Lord, I pray that you just help every one of us this morning to release to you the hardest parts of ourselves. You are good and you are loving and you accept those things in love and in kindness and you say, I will take care of that for you. You are good, Lord. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Let me take your seat. Hi, welcome to The Well. We're so excited you've chosen to join us today and want to thank you for coming. If you're a guest or returning guest, we want you to know that much of this service has been designed specifically with you in mind. Throughout the morning, if you have any questions, there are volunteers all around the building with blue name tags who are happy and willing to help. As you enter today, you should have received a service guide with more information about the well and how you can get involved. Inside the service guide or on the seat back in front of you is one of our connection cards. We hope that by the end of service, we've earned your trust and that you'll leave us your name and email. If you do, we have a no hassle guarantee and promise to only send a quick follow-up thanking you for coming. At the end of service, many of our staff will be available at the back of the auditorium at the guest center. They want to meet you, give you a free gift, and say thank you for coming. It's the third week of the month, which means it's step three of Growth Track, where you can develop your leadership, find out what it means to be a leader at the well, and learn how you can strengthen your character to fulfill your leadership potential. If you choose to go to Growth Track this week and have children with you, we encourage you to check them back into the Well Kids Ministry where we can continue to minister to them. And if you choose to go to Growth Track after second service, lunch is provided. We have an awesome message prepared for you and can't wait to share it with you today. But before we do, take a moment to say hello to those around you. That 
was a close one. Mission accomplished. Good night, baby. Night, Mama. Thank you for saving him. You are so welcome. Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day. How many of you caught some guy sitting next to you kind of like trying to wipe a tear? <laughs> Such a mushy, horrible way to start Father's Day. We want to say a real special Happy Father's Day to everyone this morning. We really do. We especially want to say welcome and thank you to everyone joining us online. Come on. Well, let's give a big well welcome to our online family. So glad that they're here. I do, uh, just before we, I, I kind of get into things, um, I, I want to say uh, a, a, just a, a quick thank you to, to some amazing teams. We just launched small groups again for the summer, and so we have just, we have the best small groups and the best small group leaders anywhere. And um, if you are not part of a small group yet, I want you to know that you still have the opportunity this summer to jump into one of the small groups. Some of the small groups that aren't meeting every week are going to be having cookouts throughout the summer. And these are just tremendous opportunities to invite friends, to invite neighbors, to invite family, to invite coworkers. It's a super non-threatening time. A lot of transition happens over the summer. And so you might have new people moving into your neighborhood. You might have new kids moving into your school. You've got new folks moving into your to your workplaces so take advantage of that and then july uh 14th or july 13th excuse me is uh serve day is is our big serve day that we do every summer so you're going to want to take advantage of that we have our serve day app which is out there and up and you can kind of look at that and take advantage of that but really quick can we just tell all of our small group leaders that we love them that they're amazing aren't they great yes So I also want to say um, a couple special uh, personal happy Father's Days and thank yous. The, the first two are, are to two men who have been spiritual fathers in my life. They are the two pastors that I've had the privilege of serving. Um, one of them was, was Mark Beal, Pastor Mark Beal. And uh, he was my very first pastor when I was actually still in Bible college. Gave me my very first job and hired me, um, probably because he was desperate, because there was no other good explanation for hiring me. And uh, just taught me so much about ministry and about character made me a part of his family. And out of that, honestly, a lot of the leadership for this church kind of came from that relationship that we had all those years ago. And the other one is Larry Pyle, and he really is my pastor. I got to serve with him for nearly a decade, and uh, he's the pastor that sent Carrie and I up here. I think he was trying to get rid of us, but he said it way nicer. And, um, and, and he has, they have both just continue to speak into Carrie and I's life, and they, they continue to be, to be spiritual fathers over our congregation. So um, Mark, Larry, I just want to tell you guys, happy Father's Day, and I love you so much. And then um, I want to say a, a really uh, special happy Father's Day to my dad, who is affectionately pop. There's a, a picture. Yes, this is us rocking out in the, in the uh, early 90s, I'm thinking, when apparently leather and cowboy hats were really in. And uh, so uh, my, my dad is just an amazing guy. And uh, a couple years ago, he and my mom finally moved back. It's the first time we've ever lived in the same state since two weeks after I graduated high school. And so it's just been such a privilege getting to, to do life with them again. And, and my dad was, was just a great guy. He was, he was a guy's guy. And uh, he taught me to, to respect everyone, to give dignity to everyone. But he was particularly um, serious about how I thought, how I treated, how I spoke about, 
how I acted with and around ladies. And so he was always really hardcore about things like um, opening the door and walking beside them and keeping them on, on the side away from traffic. And, and I remember one time um, back when my dad still had to drive me on dates, I got back in the car after a date and I could tell just from the look on his face that I was in trouble. And I was like, what, what happened? He was like, so we, um, we just run off and leave ladies now? Now you have to understand, we were parked on the curb. Her house was maybe as far away from me as the drums. But because I had opened the door and then sort of just without her walked up to her door to open it for her instead of walking with her, I got in trouble. And so my dad was just very, very serious. So I grew up with a real distinct um, impression of how you honored, how you loved, how you served the women in your life. And so my boys grew up with that same understanding about how to treat their mom, how to treat their sisters, how to treat the special women in their lives. And my daughters grew up with, with this impression of how being cherished, how being loved, how being served looked. And, and, and no matter who you are, the, the reality is your dad did something to mark your life as well. If I ask you just really quick to think about the lessons that you have learned from your dad, it will immediately evoke some kind of emotion, some kind of response from you. Whether you had a great dad or you had a flawed dad, which the truth is we all are, or, or whether you had a broken dad or whether you had an absent dad, whatever kind of dad you had, he left a mark on your life. And not just your life, but if, if you're having an impact on someone else's life, that impact is continuing to, to flow and to make impressions and continuing to mark other people's lives. That's how powerful, that's how important, that's how divine the role of fatherhood is in our lives, whether good or bad. And so today, I want to encourage us, especially as dads, if you're a, a dad in the room this morning, whether, it's a, whether your kids are grown or, or they're just babies, or, or maybe you're, you're just now uh, expecting your very first child, or, or maybe you've just gotten married, but you hope for fatherhood someday, I want you to know you're to be honored that God has, has placed you in a very unique place, but it does come with a unique set of expectations. It does come with a unique set of responsibilities. And so I want to kind of lean into that today, that God has invited you to lead. Everyone say lead. Lead. Now, here's what I want you to know. If you're not a dad in here today, um, I, I want th what we're going to talk about really applies to everyone. With just a little bit of creativity and imagination, you're going to see how you can apply everything that we're talking about to your life. Because whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a dad or not, God really has asked all of us, wherever we are, in our unique roles, in our unique settings, in our unique circumstances and season of life, he has called us all to lead but especially dads, we are to lead not only in our workplace, not only in our community, not only in our faith, but we're also called to lead in our homes. So when I say the word lead, immediately that, that word is sort of front loaded with all kinds of implications, with all kinds of ideas. And so give me a minute and let, let's just unpack what we mean when we say lead. The first thing, probably the most important thing to understand about the idea of leading or leadership or, or taking the lead in your home is that it means you're supposed to be out front. You're supposed to be the one who is taking initiative. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it says, there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, what Paul is trying to help us understand is this idea of initiative, that, that something, someone has to go first. And so what does Paul say? He says, the head of, of, of every man is Christ. Christ is the one that goes before us. Man is supposed to lead and go out before his family. And God is even the head of Christ. And so this is true in everyone's life. And this isn't the only place we see it. In John chapter 3, 16, 
It said God so loved the world that, that he gave his son. God doesn't give his son out of response to something that we're doing or something that's happening. God takes the initiative because of who he is and because of how he feels about us. Jesus does the same thing. In Romans chapter 5, it says that while we were far away from God, while we were enemies of God, while we were oblivious to God, that was when Jesus made the, the decision. That's when he took the initiative to die for our sins, to die on our behalf. God's love causes him not to, to sit back, not to wait, not to act just in response to who we are, but to initiate, to initiate relationship, to initiate love, to initiate healing, to initiate wholeness. In fact, John's gospel insists that if God hadn't taken the initiative, we wouldn't have even been able to, to recognize him, to receive him, to, to experience love at all, and we wouldn't have the capacity to love others. In, in James' letter to the church, he says now, in Jesus' new economy, things are a little bit different. So in the past, in the Old Testament, it worked like this. God gave you rules. If you broke one of the rules, that was a sin, to, to do something you knew you weren't supposed to do. But James, the brother of Jesus, says now, in, in Jesus' kingdom, we're going to run this thing in reverse. So here's what we're going to do. James says to know what you ought to do and to not do it, that's sin. Rather than doing what you're not supposed to, if you're not pursuing life, if you're not initiating life in every area of your life, your faith, your family, your work, James says that gap between what you could do, who you should be, and who you're being, that gap, that's what we mean when we say sin. So dads, men, we need to be people of initiative. We need to be people who are stepping out and going first. And, and one of the best places, the first place that you should probably do that after initiating in your relationship with God is in your relationship with your spouse. And so husbands, listen, if you are not asking your wife out on a date every week, I strongly encourage you to make that part of your weekly rhythm. And some of us, we might have a regular date schedule or, or we might work with our spouse to put that on the calendar, but we become a little lazy, don't we? Where we stop asking, we stop inviting them, we stop doing any of the planning. I mean, let's be honest, a lot of times they're better at logistics than we are, and so we just hope that they're going to have a plan by the time we get home, and they're going to tell us where they want to go, and we're just praying it's not super expensive, and, and you know, that, that's kind of how we're hoping and, and thinking that dates work. But, but that wasn't how we did it in the old days, you remember? I mean, you'd get like, you'd think about the date, you'd have a plan, you'd give her a call, you'd compliment her hair, you'd compliment her clothes, you'd compliment her mom, you would do whatever it took to sort of get her ready so that when you ask her out, she was ready to say yes. And here's what I want you to know. The same heart, the same initiative, the same pursuit that you had in your heart in those early days should be growing in your relationship, not waning. But that isn't the only place that we should initiate. We should be initiating in conversations. We should be the ones saying, hey, how was your day? You, we should be the ones saying, hey, how are we? We should be the ones getting into the deep stuff and asking the, those secondary questions. What, what did that make you think? How did that make you, you feel? Asking those color questions that as guys, we're not very good at. When, when you know you're going home and your wife is going to ask you about the meeting or about whatever it was you did, start thinking about the details that you know she's going to ask, like, what color was her shirt? You know, all the crazy stuff that women end up asking. More importantly, guys, we should be the ones that are initiating when it comes time for restoration and healing. We shouldn't be the ones stomping around the house waiting for someone else to always come to us. We should be the ones that are out in front. We should be the ones taking the initiative in every area of our life. And it's not just with our wives, it's with all of our relationships. So dad, listen, all of us get in the habit of when our kids come and say, hey, would you go outside and push me? Would you go outside and ride bikes? Would you go outside and play ball? We sort of, we might say yes. We think about our schedule. We think about how tired we are. But dads, we need to be the ones initiating. Rather than our kids always running to us and asking us to do something, we need to be the ones 
ones going to the kids and saying, hey, how would you like to go to the pool? Hey, how would you like to go for a bike ride? Hey, how would you like to go play catch? We need to be the ones going to them instead of saying, hey, did you get your homework done? Being willing to sit down at the table with them and say, hey, why don't you go grab your homework? That'll help you get it done really fast, and then we can go play. We need to be taking that role in, in their lives and not just our wives and our kids. But the truth is, when Scripture talks about a household, it talks about our whole sphere of influence. And so, men, we should be initiating in the workplace. We should be initiating in our neighborhood. We should be the one who walks across the street or down the, the, the sidewalk to meet the new neighbors this summer, to buy them a pizza, to, to invite them over. We should be the ones that are, are stepping out and taking that leadership if we want to be leaders in our home. But leading doesn't just mean doing it first. It doesn't just mean being out in front. It also has to do with the way we think about authority. And the minute you say leadership, people think, aha, I'm the boss. But actually, in Jesus' economy, it's a little bit different. So what, what leadership means in Jesus' economy is first, that you're the one that's willing to get out there and do it first. And secondly, it means that you're the one who's willing to serve everyone else. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, it says, so Jesus called them together, all of his disciples, and he said, you know that the rulers in this world, they lord it over their people. They, they, they're officials. They, they flaunt their authority over everyone who's under them. But among you, it's going to be different. Everyone say different. different. Among you, it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you has to be a servant. And whoever wants to be first among you, they have to be a slave to everyone else. So leadership never starts with the idea of authority. It always starts with the idea of taking initiation, and that initiation is first and foremost to endeavor to serve. So when we say lead in the home, we're saying be the first to serve. Be the first to serve your wife. Be the first to serve your kids. Be the first to serve your neighbors. Helen Keller said, life is an exciting business, and the most exciting lives are the ones that are lived for others. Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only destinies among you, who will, the only people who will be truly happy are those who seek and find how to serve others. So when we say lead, we mean literally be the first to serve. Now, I want to give you four specific qualities that I think will, will aid us in our leadership and help us to become the kind of, of serving, initiating, engaging leaders, men, husbands, fathers, co-workers that, that God is really calling us to be. And so we're just going to use the word lead, and we're going to break it down as an acronym. So, so the L stands for listen. Everyone say listen. Listen. And then E is for encourage. Say encourage. A is for address. And finally, D is for disciple. So that's what we want to do. We want to listen. We want to encourage. We want to address. And we want to disciple. So let's tear into that a little bit. So when we say listen, in James chapter 1, starting in verse 19, it says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, as guys, this, this, this verse is like the bane of our existence. Because men, we all have an opinion about everything. And we're pretty sure we know the answer to whatever question you're actually about to ask. And if you just let us, we could coach you right to victory. Our own life is a wreck and does not reflect that truth. But somehow, in our minds, we are convinced that that's how it works. And so, gentlemen, we're... we're oftentimes too fast to interject with our opinions, with our thoughts, with our answers. Oftentimes, specifically the women in our lives, they're just wanting to share situations with us. And what do we do? We just want to solve them. We just want to get it all solved and put back on the shelf because we don't want to really have to talk about it anymore. But what, what James is saying is, listen, guys, here's what you need to do. You need to be slow to speak. You need to be quick to listen. 
and you've got to get your tempers, your, your frustration, your anxiety, your emotions, you've got to get these things under control. When I was a young dad, um, we had, Carrie and I had three kids, just boom, boom, boom. And so they were, they were everywhere, man. They were like, I would get home and they would all crawl up me. And I would just be like holding three kids all the time. And they would each wrap both arms around me. So there was like a set of arms coming this way and a set of arms coming this way and a set of arms coming this way. So my neck was always being constricted. I was always like, I was confident these children were killing me. And I would walk around with my fingers locked all night with a little bottom here and a little bottom here and a little bottom right in my hands. And they would talk right in my, they would talk right in my face. And I can remember trying to just get them to just shh, just shh. The kids will tell you when, when they were little, the three things they probably heard from their dad more than anything else was, no, shh, quit it. <laughs> and for Isaiah, for my oldest, that was particularly difficult because he, is, he has been given the gift of words, so many words. <laughs> and so in particular, anytime he got in trouble, he it was important to him that I understood at least what was going on, what his intention was. And when he was little, I didn't want to know. I wanted his obedience. And so I would constantly just shut him down, and I would force him to stop talking and just sort of surrender his will to whatever I said. But as he started getting older, we started realizing that there was an anger that was starting to build up in his heart. And we realized that at least in part, I was responsible for that because I was always shutting him down. And so Carrie and I realized that even though sometimes it was gonna take a while and we were gonna meander to get to the outcome, that it was important that we give him a real hearing, that he needed to be able to communicate. And dads, your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your employees, they need you to hear them, not just listen to their words, they need you to hear them because there's a beautiful thing that happens. The minute someone feels heard and understood, they immediately feel esteemed. And it's okay if you don't agree once you've heard them, once they've been heard. It's amazing how much more sort of malleable, how much more supple their hearts and their spirits become. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 2, this is God's message. The God who made earth, who made it livable and lasting, known everywhere as God. Call to me and I'll answer you. I'll tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. God says, listen, talk to me. Ask me. Come to me. Tell me what's going on. Tell me where you're hurting. Tell me where you're struggling. And I'll enter into that with you in the same way that our Heavenly Father says, listen, come talk to me. Dads, we need to be marked by saying to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our kids, come talk to me. I'll listen. I'll hear you. And I'll help you. I'll, I'll speak truth and love to you in a way that it'll change your life. So number one is listen. Everyone say listen. listen. Number two is encourage. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Don't let one rotten word seep out of your mouth. Instead, offer only fresh words that build others up when they need it most. That way, your good words will communicate grace to those who hear them. Let me just say this another way. Don't let anything come out of your mouth that could cause anyone any harm that could possibly hear it. So, all of us at times, we're, we're okay kind of talking on the phone and because we understand the context of what we're saying, we're not necessarily that worried about anyone who might overhear what we're saying. Even though they may not get the other side of the conversation or the nature, all they see is us talking, maybe being sharp, maybe being harsh, maybe saying something that isn't appropriate, or it's the same thing. We're, we're dealing with our kid in the grocery store and man, we've been dealing with that kid all day and this was the day that they needed, if there was ever a day that they needed to be spanked, this was the day, and we're in public, and I can't spank them right now, and so we're like tearing into our kid, and, and all of us have seen that. 
All of us have come into a room and seen someone talking harshly on the phone. All of us have gone down the aisle of a grocery store and saw a parent just, just giving their kid the business. And every one of us immediately recognized, wow, that, that's not great. It, it sort of hurts something in our hearts. But we oftentimes give ourselves permission to do that because we think, but I understand the context. But scripture says, listen, our words are so powerful that we have to think about everyone who could potentially hear what we're saying all around us and make sure that everything we say comes to them like a gift. Grace in this phrase literally means charis, gift. That our words fall like gifts on every single person who hears them. When I was a kid, my dad always was looking for an opportunity to coach me, to make me better. And so when I would get done with a, with a game or an event, my dad would, would, would always say to me, hey, what could you have done better? And we would talk and we would kind of tear into that. And so when my kids started doing sports, that's what I started doing. And Isaiah was a natural at it, man. He, he knew the things that he had done well. He knew the things that he needed to work on and he could just identify them and we would kind of talk through it. And then when Elijah started getting older, I would say to Elijah, hey, bud, what, what did you do good? And he would think of one or two things. And then I would say, what'd you do bad? And he'd start to get quiet and I'd start coaching him up. And what we noticed is that when I would try to coach Elijah after an event, his spirit would just shrivel because all he heard from me was all the things he did wrong and that he didn't do good enough. And I realized for, for my son, that, that just didn't work. What he needed after the event was just me to tell him I loved him and he crushed it and I was so proud of him and man, did he have fun and we would just kind of play and we could coach later. We could coach the next day in preparation for the next game, but we just didn't, we just, you didn't coach before you had encouraged. Dads, don't coach before you have encouraged. Make sure that you understand that there's a time for addressing things, but it always comes after you encourage and build up and, and sort of pour life into your spouse, into your neighbors, into your kids. That the first thing that we think about when we're having a conversation should always be, how do I build this person up? How do I, how do I cause life to flow into them from me? How do I initiate in serving them in that way? In Psalms 46, verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and our strength. He's always ready to help in times of trouble. When we think about God, we run to God, especially when times are tough or we've had a rough day or, or something isn't going right. We're running to him for comfort, for protection, for peace. And dads, so much of the time, people who move towards us, that's what they're asking for. They know, listen, if your kids come and talk to you about something that they did wrong, they already knew they did something wrong. They've dreaded having this conversation with you forever. And in that moment, the best thing that you can do is reassure them that it's going to be okay, that whatever's going on probably isn't going to be the last thing that ever happens in their life, that they're going to get through this, that someday they're going to be able to look back at it and laugh. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't address things, but it means that we have to encourage first. We listen, then we encourage, then number three, then we address. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. All the men are like, whew, good. But don't use your anger, anger as fuel for revenge, for getting back, for getting even, for getting ahead. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life, in your parenting, in your marriage. In other words, it's not okay for us as guys to get angry about something and then just decide to hold it all in or keep it to ourselves. Because what happens invariably is it is going to work its way out into our relationship. It's just going to work its way out in times and in ways that we didn't intend. And so we've got to be 
known as people who, after we've listened and really heard, and after we've encouraged and affirmed, that then we're willing to go in and address things, which means, guys, we can't let moms do all of the disciplining at home. We can't let moms deal with all the issues with the teachers or with the bank or, or, or whatever other things that, that you've got going on in your life. We've got to be willing to step into that place and address things. When, when Des was, was first born, we knew she was going to be our last. And um, so Carrie just decided that with Des, we were going to change the rules. So we had, with the other three kids, we had always, you know, made them learn to put themselves to sleep. And so we would feed them at some point, and then we would keep them up and play with them for a little bit. And then when it came time, we would just put them in their crib, and they had to learn how to self-soothe and, and work it out and go to sleep. And they all did it great, and they were all wonderful children. And then Des came along, and Carrie was like, I never got to rock any of our babies to sleep. And I was like, right, because then you'll have to rock them to sleep like forever. And she was like, well, this is our last, so I'm going to rock her to sleep. And I was like, okay, this isn't going to end well. And so... Um, so, so then what, what rocking her to sleep also became her, like none of the other kids came and, and slept with us. They just didn't do that. They, 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 if they woke up in the middle of the night, they were like, oh, I'm awake. I should go back to sleep. And they had the capacity to do that. And then uh, along came lovely destiny. And so when she would wake up in the middle of the night, she was like, well, I always go to sleep with my mom. So I should probably be wherever my mom is. And she would come to bed with us. Now, listen, I, know, I mean, everyone does a little bit when they're little, but this was last night. And um, <laughs> no, that's, that's not true. That's not, that's not true. She, she was too tired. She had just got home from camp. Um, no, but she was, she was getting older, and it was to the place Carrie was begging her. She was like, listen, I'm going to tell your friends. You still sneak in and sleep in our bed. Now, Why? And I know it's kind of funny, but the reason was because we hadn't been willing to address it. Because when we made the decision in our heart that we weren't going to address something in her life, it really didn't serve her and it didn't serve us. And here's the thing I want you to understand. It doesn't matter whose fault it is when it comes time to address things. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it says, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar, now this is a high thing in the first century. Jesus is basically saying, if you're doing the most important thing you can as it relates to God, and there you remember that someone has something against you. Like, not you're mad at them, they're mad at you. There you remember that someone has something against you. You're supposed to leave your sacrifice, you're supposed to leave your worship, you're supposed to leave whatever it is you're doing in relationship to God, there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person, and then come and offer your sacrifices to God. Now, in another place, he flips it. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. And if another person, uh, if the other person listens and confesses, then you've won that person back. In other words, Jesus in Matthew's gospel says, listen, whether they hurt you or you hurt them, initiate. Be the first to serve by addressing things, being willing to go out and do it. And we have to do it in a spirit that's humble and not haughty. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should say it with me, gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. That's our attitude. That's why we start by listening and encouraging. Then we can address with a right spirit, with a right attitude. And here's the promise. Ralph Waldo Emerson noticed this. He said, it's one of the most beautiful compensations of all of life that no man can sincerely try to help someone else without actually helping themselves. When we're willing to address things in our family, when we're willing to address things in our community, when we're willing to address those things, we live in the benefits of that peace, of that restoration, of that health. So men... Please initiate, serve by willing to be willing to address things. And finally, you know I had to go here. I am a pastor. We need to be disciplers. We need to listen. We need to encourage. We need to address. 
And we need to disciple. We need to help grow people in terms of their faith. In Philippians 4, verse 9, it says, Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me, everything you saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Now, here's something to think about, Dad. Paul says, everything you heard me say, I want you to say. Everything you saw me do, I want you to do. The capacity to say this starts with us thinking through what we do, what we say. But everything in our life is supposed to be a gift, a charis, to everyone around us. And that's the beginning of discipling our kids, of growing them in their relationship to God. And you're not gonna get it right. You're gonna make mistakes. Everyone look at the guy next to you and say, it's okay. It's okay, you're gonna make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, we're quick to listen, to address it, even when it's in our own lives. But this has gotta be something that becomes normal. It has to be just natural in our lives with our wives. If you've never talked to your wife about Jesus or your kids about Jesus, the first time you do, it's gonna be the weirdest conversation you've ever had because you're just not used to it. But what happens is the more you have these kinds of conversations, the more natural it becomes. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, It says, place these words, these things that we're talking about in your heart. Get them deep inside of you. Make them like a part of you at the very foundation of who you are. Tie them on your hands and on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children and then talk about them. Talk about them all the time wherever you are. Like when you're sitting at home or or when you're just walking down the road. Talk about them from, from the time you get up in the morning until the time you fall into your bed at night. Inscribe them on your doorposts and your gates. Everyone in the city should know who you are, how you are so that you'll be able to live a long time and your children with you in the place that God promised to give you and to your ancestors. You know, one of the scariest things that parents face is when their kids start going away to college. It's the number one time where kids sort of end up falling out of faith. And that happens whether they're going to a Christian college or a secular college or a Bible college. It just doesn't matter. It's a scary time. So one of the most rewarding things This year, my my oldest daughter, Taylor, moved away and and moved into the city, and and she was just going to be surrounded. I mean, some of the stories she told us about dorm life, you know, Carrie and I, I don't think we've ever, I think we were praying more than when she was really sick. I was like, we were so worried. But then all of a sudden, I started getting this series of calls from her. And every time she called, she was asking me some question about the Bible or about theology. And I was like, what, where's all this coming from? And she's like, well, I was talking to, to my friend. I was, I was talking to Liz, or I was talking to Dan, or I was talking to this person or that person. And, and all, every time she was talking to me, she was talking to me about some conversation she had had with someone else because we had made it normal in our lives to have those kinds of conversations. Now it was the most natural thing for her to have those kinds of conversations with her friends. And guys, can I tell you that that is one of the most rewarding gifts you will ever receive as a dad is as the kids start to leave that they're calling home and they're still inviting you to have input into their life, into their relationships. And it starts by you deciding now to lead, to get out in front, to serve, to listen, to encourage, to address, and to disciple. I want to just take a moment, and I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. John said that the only reason we can experience love or express love is because we first received God's love in our hearts. And I believe that that's true about nearly every principle and practice in our life. The only way that we'll ever be the kind of leaders that we want to be is because we have first surrendered to the leadership of Christ in our lives. It's through us ordering ourselves to God and to Christ that we're able to help order the lives of those people who mean the most to us. So maybe you're here this morning and you've never surrendered to God's initiating love to you. 
Maybe you've never placed yourself under the leadership of Christ in your heart, in your home, in your workplace. I want you to know that he's here today. He promised wherever we would gather in his name, he would be here in our midst. So if you're here today, you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you did a long time ago, and it's just sort of fallen away, I want you to know in just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. And just by saying that prayer, by agreeing with that prayer, Jesus promised to come into our hearts and minds and begin that process of restoration and change. So just before I pray, if I'm going to be praying with you, if I'm praying for you, would you let me to know today, would you raise your hand? You can put it up and write back down. I'd love to be in a relationship with Jesus today. Thank you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your gift of life and love to us. And Lord, we, we just say to you, happy Father's Day. Thank you, Lord, that you took the first step towards us. And so, Lord, we want to place ourselves in this, in this line. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. So that we can become the men, the women, God, that you want us to be to influence and affect the lives of those around us. So, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into this space, to come into to my heart, into my mind, and begin your work of restoration. Begin to heal and restore my relationships, first with you, and then with my family, and then with my community and my world. God, have your way in me. Take shape in me. Be my God and King. Be my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And everyone said amen. 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 Can we give God praise for those taking next steps this morning? Yeah, God is good. Well, if you could all do me a favor and reach into the seat back in front of you or under your chair and pull out your connection card. We love to stay connected here at The Well, and the Connect card really is the best way that we can stay connected with all of you. So if you're a guest here with us this morning, again, if you would give us just your name and your email at the top of the Connect card, that's all we need, and we'll shoot you an email later this week just to thank you for coming and to give you some information about the church. If you're one of those people that, uh, that raised your hand to accept Christ this morning, we want to... Uh, join you in your faith journey. And so if you would, at, on the connection card, there's a box uh, marked, I made a commitment today. If you would check the box that best fits, we have a team in the back under Next Steps that would love to meet you as well as give you a gift this morning. And, and uh, we just want to um, be there for you and with you in this journey. Well, my name is Isaiah Schaefer. I'm the student pastor for those of you that I have not met. And uh, I was just blessed to get to go to Oklahoma this past week for Youth America with all of our students. Yes. And God just did some amazing things over the course of the week. By the end of the week, we wound up having nine students either give their life to Christ for the first time or recommit. And we had eight students that made decisions to get baptized. Yes. So for any of you students, if that was you that, that took that step and made that decision, I just want to encourage you also on the connection card to mark that so that, uh, so that we know that you've made that decision, taken that step, and, and you as well go back to next steps um, at the end of the service. At the very bottom of the connection card, there's a lined portion, and I hope that all of you would fill that out this morning. If you have any prayer requests, anything that you're in need of prayer for, um, or if God is doing something great and we can celebrate that with you, we tear that off and separate it from your personal info. And then the staff uh, pray for those throughout the week. And on Saturday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. prayer service where we line the stage and we just cover those in prayer or in celebration for, for the things that God's doing in your life. So I really want to encourage you to take advantage of that this morning. Well, here in, a bucket, here in a moment, the ushers are going to come with buckets to collect those connection cards. And as they do, if you consider yourself a weller, you know that this is your opportunity to be generous with your giving. If you're a guest here with us, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. But if you are going to give this morning using cash, we recommend that you use one of our offering envelopes. If you'd like to give by some other way, there's instructions for how you can do that on the inside flap of the envelope, or you can always give online at cometothewell.org forward slash give. 
Well, anytime we partner with you in your giving, we like to show you how your generosity is making an impact and, and uh, all that it's pr- all that it's providing and doing. And so this morning we're highlighting one of our ministry partners, uh, um, Urban Outreach Denver, and they are a ministry in Colorado that work and and they do community dinners where they bring in people, drug addicts, homeless, all these people, and they have an opportunity to minister to them and and, uh, bring them the gospel, and they're doing some amazing work there, and so we reached out to them, and their prayer right now that they've asked us to partner with them is they're in the process of potentially purchasing a new building. And so they're just wanting prayer for that and, and wisdom and in, uh, you know, this whole process and making that decision. So would you join me in praying for them and for those that took next steps this morning, as well as the gifts that were given? Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for your goodness. God, we thank you for the work that you're doing with Urban Outreach Denver. And, and God, we just pray that you continue to grow that ministry, Lord, that that your will be done with this whole uh, building purchase process, God, that, that you would make that happen as smooth as possible, Lord, if, if that's what you have for them next in this upcoming season, Lord. We pray that you would continue to grow their ministry and, and impact. God, we thank you for those that took next steps this morning and for the students last week that took next steps in their relationship with you, Lord. We pray that you would just continue to, to grow that inside of each of those people, Lord, that that you would continue to stir their heart into a deeper relationship with you, Lord. And God, we just thank you for the generosity of those that that are helping to continue to to grow your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for, for who you are in our lives. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're about to go back into a time of worship. If you would all stand, we're gonna sing one last song.
God praise. Yes. Well, again, growth track, we are in step three. So if you haven't completed growth track, if you haven't completed growth track, step three, that's going to be available just through this door here on my left, your right, or as you're coming down the hall, just past the double doors on your right. We here at The Well believe that everyone has a capacity for leadership. And so we really believe that this will help you all develop that. Also, myself and several of the staff will be in the back of the auditorium under guest center, uh, and we'd love to, to meet you. Also, if you don't follow us on social media, on Facebook, you should, because we did a giveaway this week for Father's Day, and so we have two gift cards uh, to Outback Steakhouse. And, uh, and so there's two winners that I'm realizing I don't have the names for. <laughs> So we'll let you know. <laughs> we'll make sure that you get them. But uh, yes, if you don't follow us on social media, you should because we do giveaways and sometimes you win. Sometimes you don't know if you win. <laughs> but before we head in all of our different directions, would you all just raise your hands and receive a blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace to know that we all have the capacity for leadership. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to invite a friend.